He's, he's the senior pastor. I'm the old senior pastor. <laughs> hey, uh, the person that, there are a handful of people that uh, came and helped me start the church many years ago. Uh, they were uh, mostly the uh, blood, or in other words, individuals that were part of Berean, who had the heart of mothering this church and blessing us as we went forward. And one of them, who was a deacon at Berean at the time, is speaking today. And this is, we've had this show up September and today's colleagues. And I thought, okay, so if I'm talking about my coworkers, I could tell stories, but then all the pastors would have to resign when I got done with my sermon. <laughs> and so, and I probably would too, so. So no, actually we just thought, you know, someone that's working in a, in a secular job might be a good perspective. And my friend's a very good speaker and he did a phenomenal job and I know you're gonna enjoy him. He serves as one of our deacons, our treasurer of the church, and he and Madeline and, uh, and the other core that helped us start it, we're forever grateful for them. They're all here. So welcome Dale Atchison, my friend, as he comes to speak to us and thank him for all that he does for the ministry of the church here. And I almost forgot, tonight I'm speaking on Christianity and Islam. You have grandkids, you have kids, you ought to come out. It's very important in the day we live. God be with you. I got to tell you, this is a long ways from, I teach Sunday school every morning, or every Sunday morning. And uh, yeah, yeah, I call my, my uh, colleagues together and say we're going to have Sunday school this morning. Uh, I got to tell you, it's a long ways from speaking to 40 or 50 or 60 people in my Sunday school class. I'm the church treasurer, as Pastor mentioned, and I come into the church office one day and uh, Pastor Weaver says, come back here in the office. Well, I walked back in Pastor Jeff's office and many of the pastors were in there and he said, we've decided that you need to preach on at Colleague Sunday. And I said, what are you talking about? So I said, well, I'll pray about it. And that was on Monday. <laughs> on Friday, he called me. He said, what'd you decide? And I said, well, I said, I've prayed about it. I said, I'll do it. My desire this morning is, is that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today is your opportunity to change that, to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that will begin a new destination for you that will change the rest of your life. And for others, those of us that work in the workforce and know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, I'm going to challenge you to work with your colleagues to put them first so that they too might know Jesus Christ. The scripture this morning in 1 Peter 2 verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans or unbelievers that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, that your life may so shine the Christ-like that you may lead them to Christ, that they may stand on the judgment day with you, and he may say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in. I got to tell you that I haven't always exemplified that. In my workplace, I have not always been the shining light that I should be, not always taken opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through a life that says and demonstrates who he is. So this message is just as much for me as it is for you. So who is a colleague? I thought, you know, last, year, last week Pastor Zach said, who is my neighbor? So who is my colleague? I asked a number of people who colleague might be to them or what colleague might mean to them. Some said, people I rub shoulders with every day at my workplace. Others said, a teammate, an associate, people who I deal with frequently, such as a vendor or even a customer a salesman who may call upon me. Colleague can mean a lot of different things. It's really the people we come in contact every day in and through our profession. Several years ago, there was a, a question that was on many job interview questionnaires. And the question was, if you could describe yourself as an animal, what animal would that be? 
in hopes that it might tell them something about your temperament, your personality, and who you are. Well, this morning, I've chosen to use that same question only to challenge you to look and maybe put a, a name with a face of a colleague in which you work with. So this morning, my first one is a picture of a workhorse. That person is steady and dependable. You know they're going to be there day in, they're going to do their job, put their head to the grindstone, be a good friend, and be dependable. Others, in the next question, next picture, <laughs> not so much. Perhaps they're the lazy individual that says, someone else will do the job if I wait long enough. I'll get to it when I want to or am motivated, which may never be the case. And I can tell right now some of you are already associating a face with a picture. Or perhaps the next one is that maybe they're the energizer buddy, kind of the opposite that says they're always nervous and antsy about things and about people and worried and concerned. They get the job done, they're always there, but they're always nervous and jittery. Or perhaps the next one. They're a peacock. Look at me and look what I've done. Look how pretty I am. I want everybody to know and see me. Or perhaps they're a charging rhino that says I'm in charge whether they've been given the position or not. I'm in charge. <laughs> All right, I don't want any names, but some of you are associating people right now with this picture. Perhaps they're maybe just stubborn as a mule. Or perhaps your colleague is man's best friend. They're dependable, they're there every, every day at work. You enjoy working with them. They're man's best friend, they're your best friend at work and maybe other places as well. You see, colleagues come in different, different des descriptions, different looks, different personalities. They come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different beliefs, different perspectives. And we're all thrown into this place called work. Someone once said that relationships are like the sandpapers, sandpaper of our lives. And certainly the workplace seems to be that at times. Seems like we're buffed and scraped and ground up and this workplace is just a difficult place. Why would we expect any others? Do you not have confrontation with your own family sometimes? Why would we expect anything different from people that are from all different backgrounds? But sometimes it seems that we are and our lives are buffed and sanded up, sand and sandpaper. Let's face it. How many of you work out, or excuse, work, excuse me, come out of work on Monday morning as you walk out the door, throw your head back and go, oh, that was refreshing. <laughs> Not too many of us, and I certainly don't. It's more like, God, I can't believe it's only Monday. You see, but our colleagues are put into, into our place for a purpose, that's put into, into our lives for a purpose. Some so that you might benefit them or that you might be the sandpaper that helps guide and direct them or that they may be the sandpaper that helps curb you and develop you into be the person that God desires you to be. Or maybe it's a combination of all of the above. But God puts people in our lives for a purpose. It is no accident that they're there. Much of the workplace today has a perception or attitude that says, look out for number one. Don't take any gruff, any guff. Stand up for your rights. I'm entitled to it. You see, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, right? And if you don't claw and scrape to get to the top, you'll never make it doesn't matter who you have to step on to get there, but the, the focus and the goal is position. Well, I got to tell you, I've known Pastor Weaver for a long time, and you can see what effects it's done to him. 
Actually, I wanted to pull the picture up. There was a picture. Remember when Pastor Weaver had the uh, video of him dressed up like, uh, who's the hat lady? Annie Pearl. What? Minnie Pearl. Yeah. That's what happens when you go away from your notes. Minnie Pearl. Look what happens to him. I got to tell you, though, that there's been many a days in my position, I am at the top in my organization, and there's been many a days I've looked back and said I'd give anything to be one step down. Making it to the top is not all it's cut out to be. King Solomon certain, certainly understood that, in that, that being in a position and money is not always the, happy, the highway to happiness. Sometimes, sometimes people have no, no motivation to live at peace with everyone, or for that matter, for with anyone. But we've been called as Christians to a different objective, to live one, one of Christ-like. It's kind of out of step with the world's wisdom, and certainly sometimes is not appreciated or valued by others. How many of you have discovered that you cannot change anybody? Hmm? You can't change anybody. God can, but you can't change. You can't tell some, even as, as a boss or an employer, I can tell you to change. Now, they may follow my directive, but on the inside, they may not be changing. You can't change an individual, but God can. But who can we change? Ourselves. I can change this guy. I can make a decision to change. You see, some can be improved, some of our relations can be improved if we simply work on ourselves, do everything we can to make it better, to take the servant attitude and a willing heart and a servant attitude. You see, we can never ask God to change others and help us improve other relationships while we refuse to take the first step. Scripture tells us that we have that responsibility in our relationships, whether it's a friend, a family member, or a colleague, or even a neighbor. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you sound... I just realized I don't have my glasses on. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Sounds a lot like putting others first. Take the same attitude, take upon you the attitude of Jesus Christ, who had the spirit of humility, who demonstrated an unselfish attitude, preferring others over himself. And not that I have to prove myself right, and he certainly did. He gave himself for us. Willing to go the extra mile. Willing to do what Scripture says and act in obedience to what God lays out as how we should live. That's how Jesus acted. Remember, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. I didn't see anybody standing in line to do that job. But he did. It spoke volumes to his disciples, to his colleagues. And his actions demonstrated actions and what he was saying. You may say, well, this is the business world. Get real. If I act and live that way, I'll be chewed up and spit out in my work environment. What world did you come from? Well, you're right. You can't do it in yourself. You may say, I'm not Jesus. Guess what? It's not a news flash. We all knew that. <laughs> but God does live in me. God did change my heart and my life. And he should give me a desire to look like him. Perfect? No. But a desire to live and put on a, a reflection of who he is. I understand that there's rules and policies and protocols that have to be followed, and sometimes it's not easy as a boss to demonstrate 
love and kindness. There's things and disciplines that have to take place. But even in that, I can do it in love and gentleness and firmness that says, I still love you and care for you, but there's a protocol that has to be followed. Regardless of the difficult task before us or whatever we do, there's always a way to, to provide and demonstrate love and gentleness and kindness to our coworkers. Put others first does not mean that I put myself down. Nowhere in Scripture will you see where Jesus belittled himself or put himself down. In fact, the opposite is true. A person who is strong in himself and elevates and put others first is a person who's strong in his own character, strong in his own esteem. He doesn't have to be elevated to number one position in order to understand that. Instead, he chooses because God has instilled in him where the true character, where the true character and belief and faith comes from is Jesus Christ. It's not in the work environment. It's not in elevating myself in stature before somebody or in my workplace. It's one of those biblical paradox that sometimes doesn't make sense, but where winning, we, where losing, we win. The reason it works so, self, so good is because we die to self and we no longer look into inward, but we can become outer perspective, looking to others and be unselfish. You see, putting others is a mind attitude. It's not an emotional feeling. It's a choice that you can make in any relationship. Proverbs 25:15 says, through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. How is it possible that patience can change the mind of my boss or my coworker or manager? You know, I have found that many times those who are quick to react, quick to speak, sometimes make fools of themselves. If you're patient, God says he can guide and direct. Now this other part that says, this other part says, that says uh, about breaking bones. Now I could get in the selfish part of that because there's times I'd like to see a few bones broken. My anger kind of rolls up inside of me. But I don't get this part of gentleness that goes along with it that scripture talks about. Because it's not me. If it's you doing it, it will come across as anger. It will not change. You see, the breaking bones that he's referring to is the tearing down of walls, is the mending of relationships. Doing the seemingly impossible, changing a heart, one of which might even be your own if you're not careful. Gentleness changes things because it's God doing it in and through you perhaps, but it's God. You see, attitude change only comes through prayer and through the power of God's Spirit because you know what? It's not normal. It's not normal for me to prefer others, to put others. The normal thing to do is look out for number one. But with God, there are all things that are possible. It's a God thing through His purposes, not in ourselves. A few years ago, Pastor Weaver I was sharing with Pastor Weaver some very difficult things that I had experienced in my workplace. One of, one of some of which were going to affect me personally and my employees. And I know as I begin to share with him that he could undoubtedly knew my frustration and maybe even my anger. And he said to me, he said, Dale, he said, remember this, God loves them too. He died on the cross for them, and they will spend an eternity somewhere. It's affected my reaction many times since then. If we view them in a different perspective, rather than one of selfish motive that says how it will affect me if I look upon them and look at them through the eyes of Christ, I will see and react differently.
You see, our motivation to change our perspective has to be because we love Jesus and want to please Him. If we wait for people to motivate us or appreciate what we do, it'll be a long time coming. It may be true that you never thought about work relations as friends that you love. Not first on your list, perhaps, of my colleague that I might love my colleague. You see, you didn't choose them. You got thrown into a workplace. Somebody else chose who you're going to work with side by side every day. You didn't choose them. See, colleagues are just a part of your job. Many are not lovable. Many have nothing in common with you, and some are even antagonistic. So it just doesn't seem logical that to love somebody like that unconditionally. But the Bible says that I am to love one another. Here's a picture of my family. I love them all dearly. It's easy to love them. But it says we're to love one another. Next picture. Maybe not so much. It's not quite as easy to love them. They may not have my best interest at heart. But I can't turn from what the Bible says is that he says to love one another. You see, if we love as love, if we view love as something that we give to those who love us, to those who cause us to love them by the way they treat us, then it would be true that we're not required to love them. But if we understand God's meaning of love, our conclusion has to be different. John 1, 4, 16 says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let not love in words or tongue, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. You see, this kind of love is an action. Excuse me. It's a feeling. It's not a decision or a desire. It's a decision, excuse me, not a desire. See, sometimes... The feelings are present and sometimes they're not. Either way, if I live in God and He in me, then I must love. I must live in love. Even those who I have not chosen to be my friends, if they are in our lives and we've already determined that they're in our lives for a purpose, then we must show them a friendship love through our attitudes and actions. It's a God thing to do. It will take God's power to do it. And I repeat again in 1 Peter 2.12, I started off my text with, live such good lives among the pagans and unbelievers, or unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. You see, one of the greatest indications that we truly live in God and our new creations in Jesus Christ is our willingness to extend God's love to everyone, to people who have no claim on it otherwise. They can't expect my customers, salesmen, colleagues, they can expect me to be civil to them, they can expect me to respect them, but they cannot expect me to love them. Right? How many of it have it in your job description, love everybody? It's not in your union contract, love everybody. They cannot demand you to love one another. But I can choose to. I make a choice. You can choose to live in love and truth, in an action to show a loveless world a little bit of a sample of what Jesus is like. You become the love of God reaching out to them, unconditional love, which cannot be explained or ignored. 
because it's not normal. It's powerful in its implications and its effect on relationships and lives. The Bible says that love never fails. So how is that possible? Excuse me, I'm going to blow my nose because it's just one of those things i got to do. Now, can you turn it up? In the first service, he didn't get the mic turned off. Wasn't so good. Ready? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Paul had his thorn in the flesh. I have a runny nose. It's just the way it is. Can't help it. Love never fails. You see, love is patient to the co-worker who's slow to learn, to the boss who's unrealistic in their expectations. Love is kind to the rude person, to the condescending co-worker. They may not deserve it, but I certainly didn't deserve God's grace and forgiveness either. You see, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It doesn't say how good or how bad are you perceived by others. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need God. Love is not angered, easily angered. Love keeps no record of, of wrongs. You know, the mind is kind of a funny thing. I can, uh, I can forget anniversaries, as my wife knows. I can fit, forget birthdays. And if I, quite frankly, if I don't put it on this thing, I'll miss every appointment in the book because I don't remember. But just let one of my colleagues hurt me and I can tell you what day, what hour, and when it happened. Our mind wants to remember what we want to remember. But the Bible says that love keeps no record of wrongs. It goes on. It still demonstrates love. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It does not desire to hear bad things about people. In fact, wants to hear good things, wants to believe good things in people. It does not pass it along or gossip. See, all these are choices to make, not feelings. If I decide to make a feeling, if it's all based on a feeling, there's going to be a lot of days it's not going to happen. You see, the workplace is the greatest mission field on earth. It's not a faraway land. It's the place in which you go every Monday morning. The greatest mission field on earth. God simply asks you to live as Christ so that they may see him in and through you. It will be the greatest reward possible here on earth and in heaven to lead someone to the Lord. My son makes no bones about who he is. There's people at work that have called him preacher. Not out really out of disrespect, actually out of admiration for the most part. It's not because he carries a, a 65 pound or 56 pound school field Bible under his arm. It's because his life mirrors that of Christ. And they call him sometimes preacher. Because of a testimony that goes forth every day. Opportunities come sometimes briefly and rarely. God never asked you to be a Bible thumping. Well, I'm not saying he didn't. If he did, that's God's calling on you. But he asked us to just live our lives and then we may be a mirror image of him that it might change others. You see, people notice how you act, how you treat them, and others. You see, life events happen, and along the way, opportunities come about. Young people, I want to tell you something. Don't never, 
underestimate just the fact that you're young and you cannot influence people's lives. I remember when I was in my mid-twenties, a boss, a little bit prior to that, but he took a chance on a young farm boy and decided to hire him. I've been in my place of employee now almost 41 years. He took an opportunity, a chance on me. He retired probably seven or eight years after he hired me. Never once in those seven or eight years did I present the gospel to him. He was much older than me. But he did know my life. He did know the example in which I showed. He did know I was a Christian. He knew I went to church and I lived a life that was different from him. The language come out of my mouth was not the same as his. And to my knowledge, he never darkened the church door except for a wedding or a funeral. But I remember after he retired, a few years ago, I learned that he was on his deathbed. I went to the hospital and Barney was his name. I said, walked in and Barney could not talk. He was too weak. And I began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, Barney, do you know Jesus? And his eyeballs got this big around. He understood me, but he couldn't communicate. And I began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he could know that Jesus was Lord and Savior. Would have I had the opportunity or would he have responded to me if my life had not been a testimony before that I know something different than he knows that I have a Jesus Christ that is Lord and Savior in my life? Not likely. I don't know if he knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to look for him because I trust he responded to the invitation that I gave him that day. He heard, I know he understood. You see, opportunities come sometimes brief and frequent. They come like this. You're traveling to a job site, just you and another individual. And because how you've treated others and they've noticed a difference in your life, it starts something like this. It says, can I ask you something? and a conversation that leads to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do you think about this? Because they notice a difference, that you care about people. Your life exemplifies something different that they don't fully understand because it's not normal. It's Jesus flowing in and through your life and speaking to others by how we act and talk. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, if you're here today and you don't know this Jesus that I'm referring to, you've never experienced this love that reaches to you unselfishly. I'm going to give you an opportunity today to know him. So right now, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I pray God that if you look right to me, raise your hand and look. I make eye contact with me. If you're saying, Jesus, I want to invite you into my heart and you to be my Lord and Savior. Is there anybody here today? I had one person in the first service that gave their heart to the Lord this morning. The greatest change in their life. I trust that everybody here knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Perhaps you're a colleague that has invited somebody else, somebody here to work, and you may say, you know, my life hasn't exactly been a testimony of Jesus Christ. People at work look at me as more as an undercover Christian than truly a Christian. My life, I am, I know it. It's in my heart, but I don't share it. I don't show it. Today, I'm going to ask you, you say every day is a new day, a new beginning. Every day can make a decision. I'm going to challenge you this morning that if it's that you, if that's you, and you'd like to change that decision, that you would like to be that person that reaches and that my life exemplifies that of Jesus Christ, and I want you to stand to your feet right now. Really?
It should be our cry that each and every one of us, and I admit, I'm the first to admit that I don't always share the gospel of Jesus Christ and that my life doesn't always exemplify it, but it should be our heart. God, break our hearts that we might see Jesus, that we might see the lost as you see it, as you wept over the city of Jerusalem, the city that was going to crucify them. You wept for them, not because of what was ahead of you, but because you knew it was a lost and dying world. Pastor, if you'd come. Challenge our hearts, oh God, I pray. Me included. Can we all stand together? So I'm not sure if Dale made it clear what he was really saying. He's just saying you're in the workplace and you want to make sure your light is shining bright and that through you, God can speak and that you're making an impact. And how many would say that's exactly what I want more than anything? I really want that in my life. And uh, maybe you've been desiring that. Maybe, maybe you are like just a little timid and people, you're a Christian, but most people you work with really don't know. And uh, you're put there for a reason. In fact, sometimes you're put in the worst work situation you could ever possibly imagine. And you're there for a reason. It's not an accident. And sometimes we bail out. And when light shines the brightest in the darkness, and the colleagues that you have, God has put there. And uh, I pray that God would help us. Would you pray with me, Father? Help us to live out that grace and kindness, the gentleness that he spoke of, patience, to love, God, those that are unlovable, love those that don't love us back. Help us, God, to be that picture. Be you, Jesus. Be your love. Fill us with the fullness of who you are, God, and let it flow out of us with all of your character, God. When you're in us full, God, it's who we become. We become so mighty through the Holy Spirit and power, God. We become a people, Lord, that are not natural or supernatural, who aren't acting normal, quote unquote, as in this secular world we live in, but normal as a believer, God, that your spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us and that your power flows through us, God. I pray you would put your Holy Spirit like a blanket over us all, God, that would help us, Lord, to receive from you today more so that we can give more, that we'd be full so we would spill out in our workplace. In Jesus' name we pray.